everyone, it is Coach Maggie and welcome to actually week 12. This is our last week and I hope that you have enjoyed um, being part of this Bible study and hopefully seeing the connection of how all of these things work together to really determine our health and wellness. And when we're missing some of these pillars, it's going to make the foundation sag and it's going to cause us, cause us to feel um, less than really the person that God created us to be. Um, I like to think of these 12 chapters as just that, these pillars in our home. And when we are lacking in one, one is weak, then it's going to cause stress on the others. And that's what we see and we've seen it in structures. We see a home that's leaning. We see walls that are crumbling that um, are not stable. And so it affects everything. And so today really is a very important. It's not like, oh, this is the end and it's just sort of, you know, maybe one that isn't important. This is such a important pillar. And that's talking about rest. This is an area, and I know personally, um, because it was during a period of rest that I wrote this book three years ago. And, but I had pushed and pushed and pushed myself to the edge and caused myself to really uh, basically crash. I just did a crash and burn. And it took three months to dig myself out of that state. And this was something that I was definitely lacking. Now, most people aren't at that place, but not getting the rest that we need affects us emotionally, spiritually, and physically. And the problem is that sometimes we're taking care of one sex section, maybe one part, maybe I was doing a lot of the things physically, but I wasn't doing a lot of the things emotionally. And spiritually, I was fine. But again, when we are lacking in one area, it puts pressure on all of the others. And pretty soon, everything's going to fall apart. So let's go ahead and dive in to our last day, and it's talking about rest. And we talked about sleep several weeks ago, and they are very different, but similar. And so we'll get into that. Um, we're going to be talking about what God says about rest. And it starts with the Old Testament and really creation at the very, very beginning and the importance of that Sabbath rest and how it restores us. So we're going to start, like I said, at the beginning. And in Genesis 2, uh, just the first few voices or verses, it says, thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. So in other words, God had done everything. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from that work. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all of his work, which he had created and made. And the idea of that word sanctified, it isn't a word that you hear other places, really other than the church. But it's the idea of setting something apart is very special. Okay, so he set the seventh day, the Sabbath, and for most Americans, we call that Sunday. So he set that aside as being that holy, sanctified, set apart day of the week. He did all of his work, the first six, and then he rested on the seventh day. And, um, did God need a rest? Did God need to take it easy? Did he work himself into a frenzy? Absolutely not. He was laying the foundation, being an example to us, and saying, I want this day to be special. I know a lot of people, and some of you may have been in this place at some point in your life. There are people who work seven days, seven days, seven days, there are so many strange and crazy and hectic schedules out there. Some people will work straight, maybe 10 straight days without rest. And then they may have four days off or five days off. 
but it takes its toll on people's lives. And now there's so much science and research that are showing that, that are proving it isn't just, oh, that's nice, let's take Sundays off. But it's showing that when we, you know, run ourselves into the ground, we're going to suffer because of it, okay? So God didn't need to rest, but he knew that we would need to rest. And that is so, so very important. We should be able to get the things done that we need done in six days. He created the universe, and yes, he's God. But again, he was showing us the importance of setting that one day aside that we can find rest. And then we jump over, of course we know the creation and all of that, and then we jump over into Exodus. Now of course his people, he's raised his people up, uh, the um, Israelites, and they are now into the promised land. And he is laying down the rules. And in Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11, I want to read it. It says, remember the Sabbath day. Again, this is what he said at creation. Keep it holy. Six days you will labor and do all of your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it, do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, your female servant, nor your cattle, nor the stranger who was within your gates. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in it, and he rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath and hallowed it. In other words, he made it holy. So this is even saying, if you've got servants, they don't work. If you have animals and oxen that do work, they don't work. The seventh day, the Sabbath, was that day of rest. Now, I know some of you may be saying, I'm a nurse or I have a job that I have to work on Sundays occasionally. You still need a Sabbath. I, you know, this was written eons ago. I don't think the Lord is saying, ah, oh, it's got to be Sunday. But you do need that day that you set aside. And for some, it may not be a Sunday. For some, it may fluctuate from week to week, month to month. So many people that have jobs like that. And they're important jobs. They're needed. So he is not judging us and saying, oh, it's got to be Sunday. But you do need that rest. And it's so, so important. God knew that we would need that. Later on in Exodus, it even goes on to say, again, he repeated it. And it's repeated multiple times throughout the Bible. And we'll read some of those other verses. But in chapter 31, he goes on to say, he repeats that whole same um, old commandment again. And he goes on to say, you people that break that law, they should be killed. It was that serious. Now to us, it seems hard, but yet when we open the door to sin, when the minute we open that door, it may seem like it's a small thing, but doesn't it open wider and wider until there's full blown sin? He knew that we needed that structure. We needed to keep it holy. Otherwise, and this is what's happened, that seventh day that was set apart for him, it just melts into being one of the other days. And now you look around you, most people don't have a Sabbath. On any given day, driving through a neighborhood, you see people mowing and watering and washing their car and, and working. And again, Life has changed, but we still need to have that Sabbath day. And you can determine it. We need that day to be renewed spiritually, emotionally, and physically. And I really believe that's why we have so many people who have burned out, myself included. And we're weary because we're not keeping that law. It was put in place for a reason. Now let's jump to day two, 
And again, if you don't have the book, um, Psalms 16, 5 through 11, but just go through. And again, it's talking about how God has, has blessed and he's put us in the place where we're at. But so often we deviate, we get off track, we decide, I know better. I want to do it my way. And in that section, he talked about how we have an inheritance. But part of that was finding that rest, having that rest, enjoying that rest with him. And life, think about your life, where you're at right now. How could life be look different if you had kept that principle? And again, I know for me, I am not the best at this. This this is definitely still something that I am working on continually. Because while I'm not going to get out, I, I tend not to like to go out and do yard work as much as I love yard work and it's relaxing. It is still work and it's hard work. So I don't do that, but I still struggle because I still often haven't planned and guess what I'm doing in the kitchen? I'm working. And then it's easier, but I want to get to that place. So again, don't see this as judgment on you. This is something I think we constantly need to be working on because society says, no big deal. Yeah, go to church on Sunday morning, but then the rest of the day is yours to do whatever you want. So let's keep going. When we're at rest, work should the things that we do should be so much easier on those other days because we're restored, we're rejuvenated. But I really think we struggle during the week a lot of times. It's because we didn't get the rest that we needed. We can receive everything we need from that Sabbath to take us into the week. Think of it, for example, like a filling station, okay? So often, and sometimes I'm guilty of this a little bit, we, we watch the gas tank and we, we wait. We don't want it to get too empty because that's too nerve-wracking. But we let it get down low before we go fill up. And I believe the Sabbath is that opportunity to get our tank full so that we can go into the new week with a full tank. And there isn't that anxiety, there isn't that worry, there isn't that stress that comes with not doing that. With being, our tank is on empty and we're like, do I have enough? Am I going to get there? Oh Lord, please don't let me run out of gas. Too often we're running on empty because we didn't get our tanks filled. I do want to read Isaiah 11:2. It says, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Now it's talking about Christ, but this is a verse that can be applied to us as well. The spirit of the Lord rests upon us, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of knowledge and counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So when we are taking the time to find that rest, God's spirit rests upon us. And do you know what? We get to go further on that tank. We fill up on the Sabbath. And then we use some of that gas. We use some of that. But it's like it keeps being refilled, refilled. And so things go easier. Have you noticed some days where it just seems like, boy, things are just clicking. It's like, wow. You know, I've got the magic touch. It's God showing you his favor. But you also know days where you think, okay, I've got things in place. You've done everything you know, and you feel frustrated because nothing seems to be working. That's when we're doing it in our own strength. So you see the difference doing it in, in my strength versus doing it in, a, in rest, where we're constantly being rejuvenated, okay? So rest often seems counterintuitive because it's like, because it's not, we need rest on the Sabbath, but we need periods of rest throughout the week. And I know for me, 
sometimes there's a voice in my head saying, just stop for a minute. Come and, you know, sit with me for a while. But in my mind, I'm arguing because, wait a minute, I don't have time for that. I want to do that, but I don't have time. It's counterintuitive. It goes against everything. But if we would stop and get along, alone with God and say, all right, I need to be refilled. Because you see, getting that full tank on Sunday is amazing. It's wonderful. But we are going to have to keep refueling and finding those pockets of rest. And they are so very important. On day three, there is a very familiar uh, passage of scripture that we've all heard, but a lot of times we hear it, and because it's it's written in, in a way that we, in this era, don't quite understand, we just listen and then we just go on. And again, it's in Matthew, uh, chapter 11, verses 28 uh, through 30. And let's see, I'm going to read it in two different verses because that will really help. It says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. And that's a verse, a passage we've heard again and again and again. But now I want to read it out of the message. And again, I'm going to say, for you, that is that person that continually says, oh, but the Bible is so hard to understand. There are so many amazing ver uh, versions out there. And the message is one of them. There's the TPT, which is the Passion Translation. There's one even called the easy translation. But God's word has so much richness. So let me read this. It says, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? And let me stop there because some of you may say, well, I'm not burned out on religion. But this was the audience that Matthew was speaking to. But let's fill in today in 2022 or whenever you're watching this. Are you burned out on work? Are you burned out on, you know, finding that perfect career? Are you burned out in your marriage, in your relationships with family members, co-workers? Are you simply burned out with you? It still applies. And these are Jesus' words. Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. And again, let me stop there. Are images of Christ, are they ever where he's rushing around? Never. He's walking. He's taking time to talk to people, to heal the sick. And it's not be healed and then he moves on. He talks to them. He spends time with people. We, of course, have heard, you know, where he grabs the children onto his lap. Now, mind you, his disciples were like, get away, kids. He doesn't have time for that. When he went to feed the 5,000 and then later the 4,000, they were saying, send the people away. And Jesus was saying, no, we're going to eat here together. Jesus always took his time. So when he says, watch how I do it, learn from me, he's telling us, slow down. And the beauty is we think, but I have so much to do. And he's saying, no, you don't. Do the most important things. Watch how he does it. And then he's going to show us how to do those things that really do need to be done faster. We will have his favor on our lives and we'll begin to see things. And it's like, how did I get so much done today? This is a typical day and yet I got so much more done. Whereas yesterday when I didn't take the time, I didn't get anything done. It goes on to say, learn the unforced rhythms of grace, his grace, his grace that is going to make us supercharged. It's going to help us be more productive. It's going to give us more insight to know how to do things that we're like, 
I didn't even know how to do that. Why was I able to do that? Why was I able to work so quickly? How was I able to accomplish that? It's his grace. So we have the opportunity here, this is saying, to give up our hurried craziness in exchange for his rest, for his peace. And then he will open up our minds to ways to do things better. Haven't you at times been doing something and all of a sudden you get this idea and it's like, oh yeah, there's a better way to do this. Or a thought pops into your head and we think, oh wow, that was pretty smart of me. It was him. He was putting that thought in your head. Do it this way. Try this. You know, here's a shortcut. Those are his thoughts. But instead of here and there, not very often, how would you like to walk in that, live in that place of being able to do the things that really need to be done? Because he's guiding you. He's showing you how he does it. And then he goes on to finish. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn how to live freely and lightly. And don't we want to have that freedom, feeling light, feeling like, ah, I can do this. But when we get into that overwhelm, and trust me, I still find myself falling back into that. It's because I haven't taken time to get away with him, to rest in his presence. Maybe it's five minutes just to step away from what you're doing, turn off the lights if you can, get quiet, and have a moment of just rest. Lord, show me what I need to do. Right now, I'm feeling frazzled. Can you just help me? I need your rest. Maybe put on a little music and get rejuvenated. Allow him to pour his grace in you so that all of a sudden, the downloads come, the strategy you hadn't even thought of, the ideas, all of those things. And it opens the way to be like, oh my goodness. Finding that place with him. I loved that section. So in the book, I asked the question, write down your burdens. What are the things that you are carrying that are heavy, that you would love to set down? You know, the imagery, and this is why it's so hard for us to understand it. But the imagery of the passage, the first passage, um, the translation that I read, we have seen pictures of big oxen plowing a field and they've got that yoke and it's that wooden piece of wood and then there are the ropes that come around it and those go around the oxen's neck and it keeps them balanced and they're doing the work. And generally you want two oxen about the same size. Otherwise, it's going to be off. But this is saying, God is saying to us, Jesus, through Jesus, he's saying, I want to fit this perfectly to you. And guess what? I'm carrying the biggest part. I'm carrying the weight. Haven't we all been in that situation with our kids or our grandkids? And they want to carry something and we're like, no, it's too heavy. But they are determined. And so we let them maybe take one strap and we take the other strap. But we know that we really are carrying the brunt of that weight. Maybe they're getting a few, maybe 5%, maybe less, depending on their age. But we're the one that's really carrying that bag or that tote or that suitcase. We're really the one. But we're letting them think that they're helping us. And we smile. And that's what God wants to do for us. He's saying, you think you're carrying that? Let me take the weight. You are burdened with this thing. Let me shoulder the weight of it. Yes, go ahead, put your hand on it so that you are part of the process. But I'm really the one carrying you. And that's what we need. So whatever, write down those burdens you're carrying. And then give them. Write them, look at them, 
pray over them and then hand them to the Lord and say, I can't do this anymore. It's stressing me. It's weighing me down. Maybe some of those burdens are family members. They're loved ones. They're people that you care about. But let's face it, you, you're you worrying about it. We talked about worry a few weeks ago and stress and what it does to us physically and emotionally and spiritually. Because then we begin to think God can't handle it. But we haven't given it to him. So it does affect us. So take those things. And you may need to, throughout the day, go back to that piece of paper and say, Lord, I choose to give this to you. Because so often we give it to him, but then we take it back. But we have to keep giving it to him and giving it and giving it until we finally can't hold it at all. So let's make sure we do that. Again, we talked um, in Exodus about God's commandment. But we go to another passage, and I, I'll just briefly, I'm sure you're familiar with this. God was supplying the manna for the people, and they were to pick it up. Six days, they were to go and collect it. But on the sixth day, and they were only supposed to collect enough for the day, because God supplies our needs daily. But on the sixth day, instead of just supplying or collecting enough for just that day, they were to collect enough for not only that day, but for the Sabbath. And then they were to boil or bake or do whatever they were going to do to make that bread for the Sabbath. Because on the Sabbath, they were not allowed to work. But just as people always push the limits on God, there were those that didn't collect enough on the sixth day. They just assumed, eh, there'll be some there. Maybe they got busy, didn't want to. Maybe they forgot. And they were used to the other five days just collecting enough for that day. Who knows? But they only collected enough for that day. And they went out expecting to find the manna on the Sabbath. And there was none. And those people went hungry. They didn't have anything. So that whole day, they were not able to eat until the following day because they were disobedient. God supplies our needs. What are some things, let's make this practical, what are some things we can do to improve on having a better Sabbath? I know for me, I try to figure out what I'm gonna wear on, uh, to church on Sundays. Not a big thing, but it, it is something. I tend to like to shower at night anyway, so I do a lot of that prep. I have things laid out. I know where things are that I'm going to make sure and take to church. If I'm teaching a class, I have all my stuff ready to go so that I'm ready and prepared. This is the one I still struggle with, and that's getting meals done. So that on Sunday, it's just heating something. Sometimes I do maybe have muffins or things for breakfast. But then we come home and it's usually like, oh, I didn't plan. And that's something that I'm definitely still working on. All right. So we need to be preparing better so that we can keep a better Sabbath. So that we can do those things that are so, so important. I think what's happened is the Sabbath, and again, for me and for most people, it is Sunday. It's become an afterthought. We don't treat it like it's a special day. It's just another day. As a matter of fact, I honestly believe for most people, Sunday has become the day that's the catch-up. To get everything done that we didn't get done during the week. I know, and this is very, very popular, and I'm not saying this in any kind of judgment, but considering what we've talked about, I want you to think about rethinking it. And a very, very popular uh, trend is people meal prepping on Sundays. And that just bris makes me bristle because I do want my Sunday. Now, if you work on Sunday or you are preparing and you have another day that you are calling your Sabbath, by all means. But if you don't, don't allow that. Work it in some other time. 
I try to, I'm trying at this point in my life, I'm trying to do that on Saturdays and I'm doing my meals. I'm doing better. I'm doing the meals where I cook for the week and I'm doing it on Saturday. Now, is that necessarily perfect for everyone? No, but that's what I have figured out is best for me. And you need to find what's best for you, but try to keep your Sabbath day, whenever it is, set apart and holy. So for me, now I'm cooking so that Sunday it's easy. And it's really in ways, it's it's easier than ever. We have Instant Pot, we have Crock Pots, we have timers on our ovens so that you can put food in, you know, put have it prepared on Saturday, put it on, you know, in on Sunday morning, you leave, or even if you are staying home, you it's doing its own thing and it's ready when you set it. People have microwaves. I don't, but people have microwaves. We have so many things. And so, and yet our lives are more hectic than ever. We have all of these modern conveniences, but we're not allowing them to work for us. So what are some things that you can be doing on the Sabbath? Enjoying rest. I like to go to my local church, but I like to listen to other sermons. So sometimes I do that. Go for a walk. My husband and I, when the weather's nice, we like to go for a bike ride or walk or drive or have friends over. But use paper plates or most people have dishwashers. Make it easy. Visit. You know, those are things that you can do. Now, the last day, day five, it goes to the extreme. Because what we don't want to do, my heater I'm roasting. Yeah. Um, the Pharisees loved following Jesus, and they loved catching him doing good on the Sabbath because they took this commandment to an extreme. And so in Mark 2, it talks about, um, again, let's see. Okay. He was... Oh, let me find it. Let me find it because I want to read this. Now it happened that he, and they're talking about Jesus, went through a grain field on the Sabbath. And as um, they went, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisee says, look, why do you do what is unlawful on the Sabbath? So they literally are watching him. And Jesus says, have you not read what David did in when he was in need and hungry? And he goes on to say, the Sabbath was made for man. God didn't make it so that it would be this, a yoke on us. He made it to protect us. He made it because he knew man's tendency to work, 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 and not take a rest. He put it in place to protect us from ourselves from overworking, from burnout, from being weary and stressful, all of those things. The Sabbath was never about punishment. It was about sin. It was like what we do for our toddler. We go, okay, you are going crazy. You're cranky. You need a nap. And what does our little toddler say? No, I don't. I'm not tired. But they're fussy. They're getting into things, they're crying, they're irritable, they're grumpy, and they're making life miserable for everyone. And so what do we do? We pick them up, if we're a good parent, a good grandparent, and we say, I know you don't want to, but you're going down for a nap. And that's what God has done for us. He says, I know you don't want to, but you need this Sabbath rest. So that's what he's saying. The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. But the Pharisees twisted it. And then later on, they find him healing a man with a withered hand. And again, they're going, oh, he's doing it again. He's working on the Sabbath. So let's not get to where we're doing that. So there may be a time when we need to be doing things on the Sabbath. We see someone struggling with someone. We go to help a neighbor. You know, they're unloading or they're doing some things. And we're like, okay, it's Sunday. 
but you know what? He needs some help. You know, you see maybe his wife out there struggling to lift something and you, you can't go, oh, well, it's, it's a Sabbath. That's too bad. I know that's too heavy for his wife to be carrying or his kids or him by himself, but it's the Sabbath. No, we do the things. We become like Christ. So again, it's never about allowing God's laws to cause us to say, oh, I can't do that. I can't help that person. No, it's not that. But it's about making choices, the, the right choices for us to bless others by doing good. And that's a way that we can be doing something profitable for the kingdom on the Sabbath. So, and then another verse that's really um, one that I love. I have it painted on a canvas in uh, my sewing room. And it's Psalm 4610, be still and know that I am God. Be still, we rush around constantly. So really, I'm saying to myself, and I hope to you, let's not only make sure that we are keeping the Sabbath, but let's make sure that we are finding time in each and every day to rest, to get alone with God, to pray, put some music on, close your eyes, breathe, because again, this is why we're so stressed and anxious. And then we get overwhelmed with life because we're not allowing this into our day. This is a four letter word that we need, R-E-S-T, rest. But again, we don't want it to be so, so extreme that we miss opportunities to be a blessing. I remember hearing someone tell the story, a true story about, and this was something that happened over in Israel, because again, Jewish people were following these laws to the letter, to the letter. And it was about a family that stood by and watched their home burn to the ground because to pick up the phone and call would be work. And they didn't want to break that command. And again, we might say, oh my goodness, that's crazy. And it is. It is. That is not at all what this is saying. This Sabbath rest is for us. It was created for us to protect us, to help us. So that emotionally, spiritually, and physically, we would be at that place. And the interesting thing is, again, God wants to carry that weight for us, but we're holding on tight, saying, I can do it, I can do it, I can hold this. And so we're carrying far too much that was never meant for us to carry. When I wrote this book prior, I looked at health as if we just eat the right foods, and we exercise and we live that healthy lifestyle, all is good. But I found out that's not true. And that's why I'm so adamant about taking care of ourselves emotionally, how our mind thinks. I do that five minute Monday mindset every Monday around 7 a.m. But you can watch it in Facebook. We need that. On Sundays, I do I do Soul Food Sunday, an inspiration for the soul. Because we need to be nurtured and nourished spiritually, emotionally, as well as physically. And often we're doing it all physically, but we're and maybe a little bit emotionally, but not much. And maybe we're skipping the spiritual. Or we're doing all spiritual. Oh, we're, we're on top of things spiritually. But we, and maybe even emotionally, but we're not taking care of the physical. We have to. It's like a three-legged stool. We have to balance all of those things. Because again, 
if one of those gets knocked from under you, you're going to crash. You're going to hit the ground. That stool is not going to hold you up. So we need all of those things in place. My prayer is that you will go over this again and again. If you have the book or just going through the videos, they will all be on YouTube. Share them with a friend. And I like to, at the beginning of each year, go through my book. It's a good time to rethink. Also, go through chapters when you need to. If you're going through a period where you're dealing with a lot of stress, pull this out. Go and find that video. You're, if you're, you're watching this in the group, if you're watching this in the Healthy Living Facebook group, all you have to do is put it in the search bar, stress or rest or any of the key words, sleep, exercise, those things, those pillars that we need in our lives. And it will pull up the video as well as everything I've ever shared on that topic. But this is an ongoing process. We're, we're, we're on a marathon. We're not, this is not a 5K. This is not, um, you know, um, just something where we just go and stop. This is a lifelong marathon we're running. And we need to continue to work at this and keep going back to God's word. Because again, every time I have taught this study or done it personally, just by myself, multiple times, and every single time I do new revelations, because God's word is breathing and alive and sharper than any two-edged sword. So depending on where I'm at, there are new insights, new things that it's like aha moments. Even today, as I was going through this lesson, even saying it to you, there were the things I thought of ahead of time to say, and then there were the downloads that God just brought into my mind as I was teaching it just now. And so his word is alive. So continue to dive in, continue to be taking those issues. And some of you are going through some very serious medical issues or some emotional challenges that have you worn out or maybe some physical ailments. He is the all-knowing, perfect God, and he can give you insight. He can give you those downloads so that all of a sudden thoughts come into your head. You'll be scrolling through Facebook or on the internet and suddenly there will be an advertisement for something and you're like, maybe I should try that. Pray about it first because there's lots of advertisements. But I know for me, a lot of times, something that I've been thinking about and, and it's like, wow, let me check into that. Or I'll be again on maybe social media and I'll see something and there's a scripture. Someone will post an image or someone's words will seem like they're just what I needed. I'll see an advertisement or a little clip of a sermon. And again, it's exactly what I needed. Those aren't coincidences. That's God working. He's giving you answers to your prayers in all sorts of ways. He is not limited to it being through the Bible. Absolutely. That is number one. But he can use our phone. He can use books. He can use people. He can use your friends. He can even use difficult challenges. See those challenges as him working in them and learn from them. That sickness that I had three years ago was one of the best things that ever happened because it stopped me dead in my tracks and got me going a different path. So I hope that you have been blessed. I would love to hear your thoughts, your comments. You can put them in the comments or private message me. But this has been a blessing for me, again, to go through, because God has a design. It's not my design. He has a design for your health and wellness, for you to live the abundant, vibrant life. But it's found in him and his word and through people in situations that he uses. But go to rest. Rest, 
is probably something that would make a huge difference in your life. But anyway, be blessed, take care, and uh, we'll see you around. And again, make sure you're following me in all those places on social media, 5-Minute Monday Mindset, Soul Food Sunday, and then I do a live uh, video through the week. So take care and God bless.